The writer D.H. Lawrence only lived in New Mexico for about a year, less than a year, but it's possible that the city of Taos celebrates his legacy more than the English mining town where he's actually from. When I last visited the central Taos Plaza, in addition to the usual adobe buildings and historic plaques describing the Pueblo Revolt, you can waltz into the Hotel La Fonda and view their collection of Lawrence's erotic paintings. It's always fun when an unexpected celebrity is also an erotic painter. Lucy Liu, for example. Did you know she makes erotic paintings? I love it. Why not? There are nine of Lawrence's oil paintings at the hotel, paintings that began from canvases provided by Maria Huxley, wife of Aldous Huxley, of Brave New World fame. Considering Lawrence's most famous novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover, was brought to trial on obscenity charges, you'd expect the erotic paintings to be full of naughty smut. Instead, think more gloriously thick women and the men who love to grab them. The poet Stephen Spender described the collection as having lots of swinging, pendulous love dancing. Lawrence obviously loved painting the sexual organs of men as well as women, complete with pubic hair. The paintings were exhibited in a London gallery in the late 1920s, but the police barreled in and literally pulled them off the walls, describing them as gross, coarse, hideous. The collection of erotic paintings ended up in Taos, New Mexico because Lawrence himself ended up in Taos. Driving deep into the green mountains outside the city, you can visit the Lawrence cabin, as well as the small white chapel that houses Lawrence's remains. Here's where I shall describe how I walked up to that chapel and pulled open the door and what actually happened is that the ranch, which is now owned by the University of New Mexico, was closed to the public for an undisclosed reason, and we were chased by some workers off the property. Rightly so. Well, fine. See if I care. D.H. Lawrence's remains probably aren't there anyway. Foreshadowing. But I'm getting ahead of myself. D.H. Lawrence, the D.H. is for David Herbert, or Bert, to his family, was born in a mining village outside of Nottingham, England in 1885. He was the son of a miner and a lace factory worker, but young Lawrence himself wasn't much of a manual labor kind of guy. He grew up sickly, uninterested in sports, and uninterested in becoming a miner, all traits that made him very unpopular with other boys his age. Hey bros, y'all like poetry? <laughs> Tennyson? Browning? Any takers? He tried to work in a factory when he was 16, but came down with pneumonia and had to be nursed back to health by his mother. This detail will become important, but Lawrence and his mother had a bizarre and overly dependent relationship. We have loved each other, he wrote, almost with a husband and wife love. That almost is doing a lot of work there, D.H. Lawrence's greatest desire was to escape the mines and his hard labor background. He didn't want to be a miner like his father, who was a rough around the edges alcoholic. Quote, I was born hating my father. He thought his mother married far beneath her, which by the class standards of the time she had. But as he started to enter English literary circles, he found that a scrappy miner's son was exactly what editors wanted him to be and working class stories and poems were exactly what they wanted him to write. After years of being what one might call a ladies man, <laughs> a f boy, Lawrence decided to travel to Germany to write. But before he left, he stopped in to visit an old professor of his, Ernest Weekly. Arriving at the Weekly home, he met Ernest's three young children and his German wife, Frida. Frida found herself attracted to the much younger Lawrence, but for heaven's sakes, she had a husband and three children. She wasn't interested in pursuing something more than an affair, but was definitely open to an affair. Frida loved affairs. She had already had several of them. But Lawrence wanted more than a brief affair. He felt he had finally found someone he could love the way he had loved his mother. Yes, he really thought that, and yes, he really told Frida that. Not the line I would use on a potential paramour, but it worked, and Frida ran away with him. I wish I could tell you they lived happily ever after. Spoiler, they did manage the ever after part, but the happiness was sporadic. 
Frida and Lawrence had a volatile relationship from day one. When the pair traveled to Italy early in their relationship, the unsuspecting Lawrence went off searching for alpine plants, and the 33-year-old Frida had sex with a 21-year-old friend of a friend in a hay hut. For the jealous Lawrence, Frida also had a pesky habit of missing her abandoned children terribly. I'm not a psychologist, folks, but Lawrence seemed to feel that he had taken Frida as his replacement mother, and she should be moving right along, away from her former life. David Herbert is your child now. Frida, on the other hand, believed she would get custody of her children. Her ex-husband, Professor Weekly, did everything he could to prevent it, including legal maneuvers and sending her letters saying, you're dead to your children, and they see you as a virfolt like or a decomposing corpse. Frida tried again and again throughout the years, but she was successfully kept apart from her children until they reached their 20s. Frida and Lawrence were known among colleagues and friends for their Sid and Nancy-style blowouts. They enjoyed performing their vicious fights when an audience was around to watch. So that's what you're after, is it? What are we gonna have? Blue games to the guests, huh? Lawrence was violent, pulling Frida's hair and smacking her face. Frida, in turn, would smash plates over his head. I didn't care very much, she said. I hit back or waited till the storm in him subsided. We fought our battles outright to the bitter end. Not everyone understood Frida, as Lawrence biographer John Wortham explained, because she refused to do the female things required of her. She had an aristocratic contempt for the bourgeois world. She did very little housework, she sat with her legs apart, she smoked, she said what she thought, and she expected to be waited on. I can't help it, folks. I kind of like Frida. She's a problematic fave. By his mid-30s, Lawrence still didn't have the kind of success he wanted as a writer. He felt English Literary Society never understood his work. The Lawrences lived by meager book earnings and moving between various cottages and properties owned by friends. Then, a letter arrived. It was from a wealthy woman named Mabel Dodge of Taos, New Mexico. She was a patron of the arts who wanted Lawrence to come and write about the soul of New Mexico, and she would give him a house to do so. A white woman, she was shortly to be married to Tony Lujan, a Native American man and her fourth husband. Lawrence and Frida arrived in Taos in 1922, but Mabel Lujan was to prove a needy patron. She lived a mere 200 yards away and wanted Lawrence's conversation, gratitude, and willing performance as a brilliant foreign writer for all her friends. Lawrence felt like a kept man and wrote in a not well-concealed dig at Mabel, white Americans do try hard to intellectualize themselves especially white women Americans. D.A.H.N. called for her. He also felt a deep connection to Mabel, but also fantasized about murdering her with a knife. Mabel Lujan saw Frida Lawrence as an enemy and competition for D.H.'s affection. Both women wanted to be Lawrence's spiritual muse, and he did use both women as characters in his fiction. Mabel even said that it was high time for Lawrence to have a new mother for his books. Oh good, more mommy issues for David Herbert. Lawrence and Frida had to get out from under Mabel, so they moved 18 miles away to the remote and rugged ranch owned by her son. They named it Kiowa Ranch, after the Pueblo tribe's name for the land. Basta, we are still friends with Mabel, Lawrence would say, but do not take this snake to our bosom. The Lawrences would return to America to live in Taos, but for the moment the couple had to return to Europe. While living in Italy, Frida fell in love with the husband of their landlady. The soldier, named Angelo Rivalli, was said to be a non-intellectual, with no literary interests. Frida was obsessed with him, and would succeed in convincing him to leave his family for her, much as Lawrence had convinced her to leave her family. Angelo and Frida's affair would last until Lawrence's death. After the release of Lady Chatterley's Lover, Lawrence finally had some financial success for the first time in his life. Unfortunately, this was exactly when his health began to fail. After years of suffering from tuberculosis, he said he felt like there was always a demon in his chest. Yet he refused to go live at a sanatorium. He visited the Huxleys in Paris, and they were shocked how terribly sick he was, and how he refused to admit it or seek any help. He finally agreed to enter a sanatorium in the mountains of Vence, France. Lawrence died in 1930 at age 44. 
So ravaged by disease, he weighed just 85 pounds. Frida, the Huxleys, and a few other friends gathered in Vence. We buried him, wrote Frida. Very simply, like a bird, we put him away. Five years have passed since Lawrence's death. Frida still lived at the ranch in Taos with, you guessed it, the Italian soldier Angelo. Frida decided it was time to have Lawrence exhumed from his grave in France, cremated, and brought back to America. So she tasks Angelo with two things. One, building an elegant white chapel on the ranch to house the remains, and two, go do the whole thing. Go to France, have him exhumed, transferred, cremated, and carry him back to the U.S. It takes time and planning, but it happens. Angelo arrived back in New Mexico with D.H. Lawrence's ashes in an urn, and Frida greeted him at the train station. She even noticed how impacted he still was by the death, quiet and withdrawn. The couple promptly forgot Lawrence's urn at the train station, but fortunately were able to retrieve it and bring it home to the ranch. Frida's vision was to stage a second memorial ceremony at sunset. There would be native drumming, and the urn would be placed into the chapel. But the local Native Americans she wanted to drum never showed, because Mabel Lujan, remember her, had told them there was a curse on the ashes. Frida also learned that Mabel had been plotting to steal the ashes and scatter them through the ranch, because she believed scattering was the freedom that Lawrence would have wanted at home in nature in his utopia. And perhaps Mabel was correct, and Lawrence would have wanted that, but Frida was not about to let Mabel get final control over the remains. Oh, no, 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 no. So Frida orders Angelo to remove the cremated remains from the urn, mix them in with concrete and sand, and construct a large, solid ash and concrete altar inside the chapel. Lawrence is not going anywhere, Mabel. Angelo completes the altar, and the ranch and the chapel were donated by Frida to the University of New Mexico in 1955. They still stand today. And that's the wild story of the remains of... Come on. That's not the end of the story. In 1980, a journalist received a strange letter from a relative of Aldous and Maria Huxley. This man, Baron Prosper de Auville, apologized for not coming forward with this story earlier, but quote, As a matter of fact, I am a lazy man. That's all. Relatable. De Auville reveals that after Frida Lawrence's death in 1956, he had briefly lived in Taos with Angelo. One night, after some bourbon, Angelo starts weeping and confesses to him that my worst lie is the D.H. Lawrence's cinders lie. Cinders, in this case, referred to the ashes, the ashes from the incineration of Lawrence's exhumed body. Um, do you have something to share with the class, Angelo? I threw away the D.H. cinders. <gasps> Ooh! Angelo's confession continues. He had indeed gone to France to have Lawrence's body exhumed and cremated and brought back to Taos in a beautiful urn. The exhumed part went well. The cremated part went well. The bringing him back to Taos part did not go well. D.H. Lawrence's corpse was exhumed from its grave in Vence, France, sometime between March 7th and March 12th, 1935, with government documents to back it up. There's even a story from the exhumation itself. It was attended by a British woman named Mrs. Gordon Crotch, an acquaintance of Frida's, who photographed the coffin and the body inside after it was exhumed. Others have seen these photographs, though they now seem to have been lost to time. According to Lawrence scholar Emile de Lavenet, the first photo was of a perfectly preserved body. Lawrence lay peacefully with his arms crossed over his chest. Sudden exposure to air then made the body collapse into dust, and the second photo showed only a skeleton. While I have doubts the difference was quite so dramatic, given how emaciated Lawrence was before his death, it's possible for the quick exposure of air to cause a version of this corpse collapse. Lawrence's skeleton was transferred into a zinc line coffin to be transported the 125 miles to Marseille for his cremation. D.H. Lawrence was cremated starting at 9 a.m. on March 13th, it's my dad's birthday, with the ashes collected at 10.30 a.m. 
His ashes were put into a zinc urn and marked for transport to New Mexico, America. Crematories love their records. That's not surprising to me that the one thing we know for absolute sure is when that man was cremated. At the time the bones were swept out. This is where it gets complicated. Angelo, in his weeping confession, insisted he was a victim of the bureaucracy of local French laws preventing him from bringing Lawrence's urn back. It would have cost an enormous amount of money. And as someone who has shipped many an urn to many an international destination, I side with Angelo when he says the rules can be arbitrary and impossible. For this reason, Angelo was forced to dump the ashes of D.H. Lawrence somewhere into the harbor at Marseille, mail the empty urn to New York, declaring it a valueless sample, and discreetly fill it up with wood ashes, like from a campfire, once he got there. It's no wonder he was so quiet when meeting Frida at the train station. He was overwhelmed less by thoughtful and discreet mourning than he was by guilt. However, scholars insist that Angelo had no reason to make the dump and dash. He had all the proper permits. He was ready to go. Box of Lawrence tucked up under his arm, headed back to Taos. The more likely explanation may be money. Frida and Angelo fought about money, especially his desire to send money back to Italy, to the family he had abandoned. It's possible that Frida reimbursed Angelo for all manner of transit fees, but since he never actually transferred the urn, he was able to pocket all that money instead. Even Baron de Auville in his letter described Angelo as a miser to an incredible degree. This mystery may never be solved. Even if Angelo had dutifully brought the ashes to Taos, which his tearful confession makes unlikely, pouring them into concrete meant identifying the presence of human ashes would probably be impossible. Given how cremations were performed at the time, an urn of Lawrence would likely have contained chunks and shards of human bone. Even though the human ashes no longer have the DNA of the human they once belonged to, if Lawrence had remained in his urn, the ashes would be easily identifiable as human, if they were indeed human and not wood. This whole thing would have been solved years ago by just popping open the urn and taking a peek. But because they are in concrete in that lovely white chapel, there's no way to know. One wonders if Angelo was delighted to hide the evidence of his crime. Oh no, Frida, you believe Mabel wishes to steal the ashes? You would like for me to mix them up and put them into concrete? Well, as you wish, Frida, my love. This video was made with generous donations from death enthusiasts just like you. All right, here we go. Hello and hello. One, two, three. And then I have to wait. One, two, three. Oops. Dropped it. Boop, 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 boop. Back it up. Back it up. Dump truck. See you later, I mean, at the train station. It was over there on the remote. I'm like, guilt. Stop. Stop. Stop right there. What happened to Teenage Lawrence? Bleh. Bleh. Hey, Hut. The couple had to return to Europe. To Europe. I think it was, I knew they went to Italy, so I tried to say, Italy and Europe, so it came out. Italy, Europe. She had three kids. Kids. That's children and kids. Frida still lived at the Rance and Tau, the Rance and Taos. I can't do degree, degree, incredible degree, degree. I just sound so American when I say degree. To an incredible degree. That's bad French. Bad French. There's no pronunciation. The hell? It's a very popular word. All right, we're just gonna keep going. How about that? Hol, Holville, Holville, Poste de Holville. Excuse me, what's going on? Excuse me? Squeeze me baking powder? Pachoo, pachoo. It's just getting hot is the thing. It's getting hot in here. Better finish this video. We're almost there, we're almost there, we're almost there, we're almost there. Almost there. That was a little awkward. Really gotta hit that line. You know, when you got a great line about sex in a hay hut, you gotta make sure you do it till you hit it. All right, that's it.